what this is all about is your right to freedom of speech. What made America great is an independent, vigorous press. If a jerk burns a flag, America is not threatened. Political speech is the heart of the First Amendment. We're expressing their religious beliefs. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all the parties. Welcome to Speaking Freely, a weekly conversation about the First Amendment, the arts, and America. I'm Ken Paulson, Executive Director of the First Amendment Center. Joining us today to discuss a show with a legendary history of censorship are Craig Smith and Elise Stone, two cast members from the Jean Cocteau rep production of The Cradle of Rock at the Bowery Lane Theater, and David Fuller, Creative Director of the production. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Now, this is a show that peaked in 1937. It was uh, at the height of its power. Mm. Why are you doing it today? It's funny, you know, some people say that the cradle never did rock, but uh, <laughs> I kind of disagree with that in some ways. And I think that a lot of what Blitzstein had to say back then still is still relevant today, whether it's in this country or also in other parts of the world. So that's really why we decided to do the piece. Now, the two of you are acting, at least in this performance. What is this play about? Why, why is it different from other things you may have done? Oh, well, see, for me, aside from that, the, the play is very interesting within its historical context. Um, for me, I think that the, the play really speaks to me because it's really about the big guy exploiting the little guy and the little guy kind of standing up and saying, hey, if we all get together, we don't have to be exploited in this way. And um, I don't think that that issue has died since 1937. I think yeah. it's still as relevant today. And that makes it very exciting. Now, Craig, you play the, the bad guy. That's right. And, and, and uh, do, do you play it broader? Uh, do you play yeah, you know, I mean, he lends itself to a, a very kind of uh, broad openness, very big style, almost caricature. Uh, the thing that is the real challenge is trying to find a kind of humanity under there, uh, underneath that character, and uh, it was difficult to find it. Uh, but but I, I, I think that we did uh, in kind of giving Mr. Mister a bit of a more of a dimension so that you can see that he's not just a total, total villain, that there is actually some reasoning behind what he does and he doesn't know what he's doing is bad now for those who have not seen the play or, or even the Tim Robbins film which was about the making of the right. of the play we ought to step back uh, the reason this is so different is it's, it's basically propaganda uh, it's it's a very powerful anti uh, big business pro union right. Right. Uh, play produced by the federal theater project and, and can you talk a little bit about what the role of the federal theater project was back in the 30s well, in 1937, I think it was a part of the Works Progress Administration's uh, effort to employ uh, people who were needed employment. And uh, one way was to get out-of-work actors to uh, make a living, and so the Federal Theater Project was, uh, was born. Project 891, which was the unit that uh, Orson Welles and John Hausman were running here in New York City, was the uh, producing entity that did The Cradle Will Rock. And they had done a lot of other shows. They, they had done... Um, uh, a a fascist version of Julius Caesar, for instance, which got a lot of notoriety. And and when Mark Lidstein brought this project to Orson Welles and John Hausman, uh, they uh, they really liked it a lot. And and I think it was for a young Welles uh, somewhat of a of a of a way to to say something to the uh, the capitalists and the, the government of the time and all. A very young Orson Welles, like oh, 22 21. or 23 years, yeah. Yeah. years old. And, and uh, this play uh, was funded and ran into trouble somewhere along the line. It was a time of tremendous union unrest in the country, and there began to be speculation that perhaps they wouldn't allow it to be shown at all. Right. Uh, I mean, some of the viewers might not understand that back in the late 30s, the union unrest was not just a big deal. It was a life and death deal. People were murdered by big business um, owners who were frightened of um, organized labor. What happened to the production? It was, it was well oh, on right. its way and, and suddenly... You know, and Orson had this great idea. He had, these, he had this, this set that was this, these, these glass wagons with um, neon lights underneath and there was supposed to be this huge event that I think had absolutely nothing to do with the piece but, he, but it was going to be some sort of spectacle and the, the there was unrest and there were rumors that they were not going to get the funding and, and finally the night of the first performance, they, the theater, the Maxine Elliott where 
uh, the play was going to be produced was locked. They weren't allowed in. They sort of snuck in so they could get back to their office, which was in the dressing rooms downstairs. And then they were frantic to find the theater. And this is a uh, this this story, which is told very eloquently in one of of uh, John Houseman's books, uh, one of his autobiographies. Um, they were looking for a theater. They were determined to put the play on. Someone was sent to find a piano. Ultimately, they found the Venice Theater, which was allegedly a rat-infested theater 20 blocks north on Broadway, um, around 57th Street, I think, actually, in Broadway. Um, and the audience literally marched up Broadway and uh, went into the Venice Theater. And I don't think the show started till about 11 p.m. with Mark Blitzstein on stage. And Mark Blitzstein was there with the piano, and he was fully intending to play the entire piece for the audience because the actors were forbidden by the Actors' Equity from performing in this piece. Um, and then the rest of the cast who were in the audience stood up and they, and they performed the piece from the house. But it was evidently quite a, an electrifying evening. Okay. And we had some people from our, our audience, so, hey, Webb, who were actually were in the first in the first uh, attending the first that performance. That first performance, yeah. that's wow. right. Yeah. And they, they did the whole march up the street. Yeah. And everything. It was really. Yeah. It's an extraordinary story, and one of the most electrifying nights in theater, where the basically the government is saying you can't put this on, and the people go and put the show on themselves. And when the, and, and and the unions themselves. The great irony is that the unions yeah. said you can't put on a pro-union <laughs> show, uh, and defied all that authority and right. bent the rules and managed to have this extraordinary evening. Of theater, and after after this performance, this wonderful performance, that they did then do a, a, a very pared down version, which ran for I think 100, 120 performances, where it was missed, just Mark Blitzstein playing the piano on stage. They had the actors on stage with chairs, and they performed it very bare bones. And, and I think since then, it got a lot of play up until the McCarthy era, and then. Um, it really had a, a, a time of really not being done for quite a while, and then it was revived intermittently, really. Blitzstein was uh, uh, largely unknown for a good number of years, yeah. uh, until Three Penny Opera, his ad adaptation of that. Yes. Of course, Bobby Darren brought him right. wealth mm -hmm. with Mac mm -hmm. the Knife. Uh, extraordinary story he had as well. I'm curious, uh, asking Elise and Craig, when Tim Robbins did the film story of this, he said, you know, all through the years of, of uh, acting school and art school, all, of, all my college education, I had never heard this story. Were you familiar with the story? I was not. I was not familiar with the story. And, um, and I find that rather shocking, actually. You think it would be uh, particularly um, among theater training that at least the stories would surface there. And no, I had never heard yeah. the story. I, I had heard about it. Uh, uh, I'm older than Elise, so uh, <laughs> that might be the reason. Uh, I think one of the curious things, though, is that you know it, that the legend of the opening night has almost overshadowed the play itself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's more famous for that opening night than the play is actually, or the uh, opera or musical is itself. So it, it's very interesting to find to take a look at the at the piece itself, just by itself. So that was an, that was an interesting thing to come back to. Now. It's a great observation. Yeah. So. How good is the work? How, it, to what extent is it simply a curiosity? You know, well, it, it is really a good, good piece of work. <laughs> it's good. The music is very difficult and complex, and um, and it's very clear that Blitzstein's heart and soul went into um, making the music serve the lyrics because what he is saying is very very important to him. But just the music itself, as a composer, Blitzstein was a very good composer. Yeah. One of the things I said to David when we first went into rehearsal, I, you know, when we were listening to it and Charlie and David were talking about it, I say, if we can find the angry passion that this piece came out of in 1937, if we can somehow touch on that, we will have found our way into this piece. Uh, and that means that you can't treat it as just a piece of history. You, you, you must not make fun of it. You must not make light of it. You must go right for the guts of it. And if you find that anger and you find that passion that that came out of, it frees everything. And that was the energy that Blitzstein put into that piece of theater. And if you go there for that, you can release that energy. And he tells the story very well. He sets up these characters so that you get to see in little snippets, because the scenes are very, very short, but Blitzstein gives you the world of Mr. Mister and his family, Junior Mister and Sister Mister and Mrs. Mister, and then you see the people who have 
sold out in order to advance in the world of Mr. Mister. And then you see those people who live, you know, below the margin line who are trying to survive. And the guy like who is Larry Foreman, who is the union organizer, who says he comes from property, middle class, intelligent people who have their eyes open and see what's going on. And uh, in these very small vignettes, he tells a story beautifully. When you do a new play and you're uncomfortable with a line, it's permissible to say, you know, this might work better. What do you do with a piece of work that's, that's almost, you know, 60-some years old? Well, one of the things that... The Jean Cocteau repertory is very... Um, the playwright is, is paramount in terms of how we perform the cocktail. So whether we're doing Shakespeare or Moliere or a, a Greek tragedy or a, a modern play, we make sure that we... Uh, uh, do service to the playwright. So we really don't want to mess around with his or her words. So so really at the Cocteau, we try to make it work because that's what the playwright wrote. Um, so the answer to that probably is we would make it the line work no matter <laughs> what. But a lot of people have also, you know, wanted uh, you wanted to make it, you know, more contemporary, relevant, and you know, you know, kind of updating it or something like that. And I don't think that is the correct thing to do, uh, because one thing, I, again, I don't think that people really know the piece as it stands by itself, and really going after what Blitzstein was after. And in a way, that's kind of an easy way out, actually, is to make it relevant and make it all very contemporary. There's a universality about the piece, which I hope we've gotten, uh, we put across with our design the concept of set design and the costume design, but in terms of the actual lines and lyrics themselves, um, we've stuck to Blitzstein even when there's a point where Mrs. Mister is, visits the, the mission and uh, the narrator is saying, uh, in 1915, this happened, in 1916, this happened, and then 1917, this happened. And clearly that was World War I that they're talking about, but it resonates to World War II, it resonates to every war that we've been involved in. So, uh, and I think the audiences do get that resonance. Which and it really short changes your audience if you say that, you know, you have to explain the metaphor. You yeah. know, you just lay it out there, that, you know, the, yes. <laughs> they, can, they can make the connection. See, we're used to doing 400-year-old <laughs> plays. And so, and so, even when you you can set Shakespeare anywhere, and you don't have to mess around with Shakespeare, you know. Right. So this is sort of cutting edge stuff for you if it's only sixty three years old. That's true. Um, is there um, is there a message um, that has carried through the years? I mean, it's curious to see, interesting to see the that it has almost been cyclical in the production mm -hmm. of this. That for years it was sort of dormant, and then it came back. Um, how how did this kind of grow through the years so that it would have um, a life. I mean, do any sense of why this play has had continuity where others get forgotten uh, shortly after they're introduced in 1955? Well, the, 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 for me, the primary message of this play is, uh, this musical, is that your voice does matter and you, and you can be heard and, and, and more than one voice in the aggregate is powerful and, and change can result. And whether it's forming a union or whether it's voting for a particular person in office or whatever, it's very important. So I think that kind of an issue is so part and parcel um, a democracy that um, it has to keep coming up, I think. It can't help but, you know. Is there a difference between the performances you engage in um, and what you saw on paper? I mean, is it a more powerful work when performed, or is that universal, that always happens? Mm -hmm. I think that it. I think that it is. Uh, you know, um, we are not as a company. We're not used to doing uh, musicals, uh, so th this was an unusual experience for us. You know, I, I tend to think of it as a lot of the scenes, the flashback scenes, as kind of uh, a, a, a psychedelic cartoon music hall, you know, and they kind, of, they kind of just pop up at you, and they're larger than life, and they got this kind of you know kind of thing, pizzazz kind of going for them. Um, and when you go for that kind of presentational entertainment, now we have done a lot of Brecht uh, in the past, and uh, I, in fact our theater is rather well known for doing Brecht, so uh, that gave it, I think kind of gave us a leg up on that kind of thing, a very presentational uh, uh, way of going about it. Did the Brecht connection tie you to this? Well, yeah, you, you know, you can't help but, but stage it in a, some ways like a Brechtian play because, uh, well, Blitzstein was... Um, he dedicated the piece to Brecht. So 
and there's an awful lot of it in there. So yeah, it is very presentational in, in, in a lot of it. So, so when Blitzstein, um, uh, he had he did the first the song uh, "Nickel Under Your Foot" for right. Brecht, right? Right. right. The, the and then. Right, he played, he played Nickel Under yeah. Your Foot and at a party, and this is another apocryphal story probably, but he played Nickel Under Your Foot, for, at a, I believe, at a party uh, for Brecht, and Brecht said, that's really great, you know, but there are other prostitutes besides prostitutes, you ought to write a musical about that, which basically is what got him going and made him write this, this musical. Uh, I'm sure a good number of, of our viewers and Americans in general uh, first heard about the Cradle Will Rock have, after having seen the Tim Robbins film. Right. Um, I'm curious, you, you, have you seen the film, and what's your reaction to that? Uh, yeah, we did actually, when we knew we were doing this play, uh, went out and, and saw the film, which I wanted to see anyway. Yes, actually it did. In the historical context um, of the events around the play, I think, I think certainly elevated um, the experience of doing the play in a way you feel more, even more privileged to be able to... Uh, put something on stage that was banned from the stage. And that's actually happened to me a couple of times in my career where I've been able to do a play that was banned in its own time, in its own country. And it actually, there's a kind of honor and responsibility about bringing forward the work of a deceased artist who was not allowed to see uh, the fullness of their work in their own time with that kind of censorship. It was a message in the film that you rarely see in film, I, I thought, uh, in terms of the need to protect against censorship. Did you have a reaction to the film before? Going Absolutely. I thought that, I thought that, well, I thought, uh, one, I just, I just really admired the film, just as a piece of filmmaking. Uh, it's the same way that I admire uh, the play uh, as, a piece, as a piece of artistry. You know, it, we get so hung up on relevancy. You know, you know is, is everything relevant? You know, I think that we get uh, hung up with uh, this play uh, that way. And, you know, just on its pure artist, artistic merits alone, The Cradle Will Rock, uh, is a wonderful piece, and I think that Tim Robbins made a great movie, you know, uh, and, uh, and a movie about a very special time in theater and labor and, and very important to uh, the citizens of this country. I had a very strong, positive reaction to the movie, but I know the play, the music so well that I wasn't sure if I had such a positive reaction because I knew it so well, because I was getting all of the innuendos and all of this, all of the little things that he was putting in about this is how Blitzstein thought about writing about this song or whatever this is the image that he saw in New York maybe that got him to write this or whatever so you know it was fascinating to me and I did really enjoy it I'm really say. looking forward to going back and looking at the movie again yeah. after yeah. now being really familiar with yeah. the, the, the piece yeah. Yeah. The, the performers in that original production um, had to make the ultimate choice they're, they're standing in the audience and trying to decide whether to defy the unions, in effect to defy their government. Uh, several participants from that night, as I understand it, later suffered some form of blacklisting, um, either directly from that evening or because their affiliation with other people and with right. an entire movement. Have you, in your own experiences, ever had to make a tough choice or ever faced a situation where you felt your own creativity was being censored in some way? You know, I got to say for me personally, I'm, I just have been fortunate. I'll knock on, on this table because uh, I haven't had to. No, not yet. Any experiences? I, I don't. I, no, I don't. I don't believe so. Uh, we uh, um, a few years ago we had a relationship with uh, uh, Edvard Radzinski, uh, uh, the uh, uh, playwright from uh, Russia, and uh, this was before per Perestroika, and uh, he came over. Um, at that time, and he was like one of the, uh, it was one of the first times that uh, one of the popular playwrights of the Soviet Union was allowed out to come over to see one of his plays, uh, and he came over here at this point, at that point, and we would get taking some rather interesting telephone calls at that time, <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, uh, from like the State Department and, and all kinds of things like that, and we had some rather interesting people show up at the theater uh, for performances, um, and that was, uh, that was a very interesting time. Uh, but uh, no, I must say that as an artist myself, um, no, I have not felt a censorship that I have been aware of. I do think from time to, to time we run into um, individual donors because we're a nonprofit theater who maybe do not like the kind of work that you know that we might be selecting at a certain time who might voice an opinion sure. about whether they would uh, 
choose to fund us, you know, to, with any amount of money the next time around. But I, I think the theater has always taken the stand of that, you know, we will, we're going to produce those works which excite us and hopefully our audiences and that continue to be thought provoking because that is, uh, that's always been sort of a hallmark of the work at the cocktail. So we want people to leave the theater asking questions and having interesting discussions about what they've seen and how it's affected And them. the Cradle Rock so. addresses that same question yes. about art for art's sake and who's going to pay for it and all that kind of that's thing. That's right. Yeah. So while we're on the topic of the audience, tell me how the audience responds to this production. Yeah. Tell them about the audience. Well, we've had, some, <laughs> we've had some wonderful experiences and because we also do uh, symposiums or talkbacks after a lot of our, of our performances, we've had some reactions from our audiences and in particular from left wing to, to right wing to one woman who stood up and she quite courageously I must say stood up because she was clearly in the in the major minority and she said this is wrong you should not be doing this piece I mean I don't agree with any of it it's just gonna it's just gonna make people get out and do something <laughs> and, and, and she, she the actually said that performance or? It, w it was at a, it was after the, the show. show yeah and I and which I is thought, a better place than in, in the middle yeah. of the performance <laughs> right really <laughs> <been> inappropriate <laughs> and so so there that's the the may I say the conservative viewpoint and then on this past Saturday night we had an incredibly thrilling thing happen the actors do their their uh, curtain call and then they exit through the house and out the, the into the front lobby and as the actors exited um, somebody stood up we ha I knew we had a group of people there but I didn't know what the group was um, one member of the group stood up and said I would like you to invite you all now to join me in singing the International. Mm -hmm. And then about a third of the audience, the audience is still all there, everybody stood up and a third of the audience sang the International in its entirety. Mm -hmm. And the actors then came up to, to sort of stick, peek in the, the, the door. I didn't and, know what was going on. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it had to be one of the most electrifying moments that I have ever experienced in the theater. And it was one of those things that you'll just will always remember. And, and they very had fittingly, very they fittingly, did. it was yeah. the day of the Labor Day parade, oh my, of yeah. course. So. Yeah. You didn't pass out weapons or anything no. like that. No, but that's exactly the thing that that lady was afraid of, I think. <laughs> and I believe that is exactly what Blitzstein wanted, yeah. is that, you know, this feeling that his play would get people to stand up. And, you know, I think his words were that, you know, just seeing his play would make people start the revolution, that it, yeah. would, it would move them. So it was an extraordinary evening in theater for, for the actors. I mean, it's one of those theatrical events that was... Uh, maybe close to what happened during the first performance. Yeah. We had a performance this, this morning at uh, 10 o'clock for uh, high school kids. Uh, this is our first uh, high school kid uh, uh, performance for the high school kids that we've done. And uh, we have a symposium afterwards. And the first question uh, was, is art diminished because it's political? <laughs> <laughs> really? Whoa. Whoa. And how long was your answer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We basically said all art is, is political, political on some level. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And they bought that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's good. And was the reaction from a younger audience different from uh, a more adult audience? You know, I think that, I think that um, the reactions are different, but I think that the reactions are different in, between different ages, even in older audiences, because uh, we have had a few people who were there. Uh, on the original opening night, and and that audience has a completely different reaction than say a middle-aged audience does today. Yeah, somebody so. who lived in 1937 is going to have such an immediacy with with this with this play that somebody who was born in uh, 1987 is not going to. Uh, it's just a, a, a different reaction, but it still does not take away from the power of the piece just by itself. It's amazing that people would say they were in the audience that night, roughly the same number who saw Bobby Thompson's home run uh, yeah. in, in another uh, <laughs> venue. Is this the most powerful play you've been affiliated with? Mm. It is among the most powerful plays, I think, that I've done. There is so little American political theater that, is, that, that doesn't homogenize the culprit. You know, this play really stands up and says, you, Mr. Capitalist, are the one who's wrong, and points a finger, and it doesn't say, "Oh, there's a problem with society." You know, he—it's uh, a—it's very ballsy. I mean, he really points a finger and says, "This is what's wrong. We must do something." And, and, and they don't have to And what really—what strikes me most about it is that, you know, that anyone would think that it wasn't—it didn't still have great resonance and relevance today. 
you know, there's a 12-year-old boy in Canada who's been working for the last two years to help children uh, around the world who are living in slavery and child labor. And um, that very often, I think, we forget. We turn our, our eyes away from what's happening in our own country, and we're certainly not looking at the rest of the world. And I think a lot of the press sometimes keeps us from looking at what's going on in the rest of the world. Let's which not, is why I love that song, Freedom the free of the Press. press. <laughs> let's, not, let's not go bash the free press. It's one of the five free. Um, Absolutely. And this is a play that, uh, and a musical, that even if you don't buy the politics, you have to applaud the passion. Absolutely. That's, yes. that's very important. Absolutely. Uh, Orson Welles once called the Cradle of Rock uh, indestructible, and in your good hands, you've proven that once again. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Our guests have been David Fuller, Elise Stone, and Craig Smith from the production of The Cradle Will Rock. I'm Ken Paulson, back next week with another conversation about the First Amendment, the arts, and America. I hope you can join us then for Speaking Freely. Mm -hmm.